Hello, hello, hello. My name is Mopi. I'm a developer advocate at IBM. I have Nick with me. I'm also a developer advocate at IBM. Uh, together, we're going to present uh, some uh, AI related stuff to you guys. Um, this was a meetup we ran in person a couple of days ago, but there are a lot of questions that was unanswered because of the time constraint we had. So we planned with, I, I thought, you know, I, I'm going to grab Nick and try to uh, talk to you guys about some of the stuff we didn't get to talk on the meetup. Huh? So Nick, can you like quickly tell us what are you going to talk about today, Nick? Yeah, so today we're going to be going over some like very basic computer vision topics. And then towards the end, we're actually going to dive in and build our own object detection model. Um, and we're going to walk you through that, that entire process. Yeah, and I'll be very honest, like this whole thing is kind of a ruse for me uh, to kind of trick him into teaching me AI stuff, so which is which working out great. And I, I just wanted to bring all of you with me in this journey that where I learn AI related stuff. And hopefully we'll get to do this more often so that you know every time I mean Nick sits next to me so he can't really go anywhere, but I'm gonna try to bring this whole you guys with the, with me in this journey where I learn stuff from Nick and you guys can learn too. Um, so uh, Nick I, I believe you have a presentation for us. So you want to jump yes. into that? Yeah, let's do that. Okay. Okay. All right, so uh, first things first, what do computers see? Um, and here's an example of what a computer sees. When we take a photo, it's, you probably can't even see the text, but it's just lots of hex code. Uh, and that's all the, that a computer gets. Um, so how can we teach the computer to actually learn what this garbled noise mess actually means and represents. Uh, and we can do that using AI and uh, training. So we can show AI a bunch of pictures of cats and a bunch of pictures of dogs. And, and then the, the AI, we're going to kind of just talk about it as a black box for a bit, um, uh, starts to develop an idea of like what all of these numbers actually represent. Um, however, most state-of-the-art models are trained on millions and millions of images uh, with like each category, like thousands, thousands of pictures of cats for, for AI to actually learn what a cat is. Uh, and you might be thinking, wait, 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 what? I can identify an object only after seeing it like a couple times. Uh, you show me a, a brand new object and you're like, Okay, and then if I show it to you again, you're like, yeah, that was the thing you just showed me. Like, really easy, right? So why does it take so long for AI to learn? Um, and to kind of understand, let's play a little bit of a game. If I showed you this picture and asked you, or told you that this is a cat, all right? So I uh, just soaked this in, Mofi. Yeah. Uh, this is a cat. I know all about cats now. You can just right. show me anything. I'll, I'll tell you what it is. All right, and then uh, pay close attention because this is a dog. Ah, right? well, I could tell. Yeah, you can tell. Okay. It's not a cat, obviously. So right, right, right. Um, and then, can you tell me what this is? Is this a cat or a dog? Hmm. Is this one of the scenarios like where it's a dog cat from the? No, no, no. This is actually yeah. a cat or a dog. Oh, okay. Um, you should be able to tell because I just showed you those. Right, 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 right. Okay. Yeah. No, I think I'm I'm stumped. I, I don't stumped. know. I don't right. know. Well, um, each three of these slides were were all cats. Okay. Um, just different different cats. So one of you obviously knew that I was a dog. It was actually a cat. So you like basically you I lied. I yeah, lied, lied to me. I was I too lazy to get a picture of a dog. I'm sorry. Um, but yeah. So so why can we learn so quickly? Hmm. Um, but I don't know about you, but I've been learning how to see for probably 20 plus years now. Wow. How about you? Um, they're on the same. They're on the same, probably. Yeah. Yeah. So. Um, what, what have we actually been learning this entire time? I think, like, again, I'm coming from a completely non-AI background, but I think we learn a lot from context in many ways, right? We can, we, say, we have seen some other cats, now I can relate to that cat from it. When I see a new cat, look similar, I can just relate to it a little bit. Yeah, yeah, uh, definitely context plays a big role in uh, how we understand what we're seeing, but like even for things that we've, we have completely no context about, I just showed you, like a an abstract shape and showed it to you and then showed you the same shape a little bit later you still probably be able to distinguish between between the shapes 
Um, and, and that's actually one of the, the big things that we do learn are, are the, the fundamental basic shapes of, of what we're seeing. Um, and if you kind of think about it, when, when the lights hit our eyes, uh, we don't just see the big blob of noise that the computer sees. We actually see a uh, shape and various lighting. And, and a lot of this stuff is, is kind of learned. Um, it, it doesn't just uh, pop out at us like that automatically. Um, our minds kind of process the light in a, a more structured and understandable way. So our mind picks out like, where edges are, where curves are, and then we can use that to um, like a more of a building block, an abstracted layer of, of uh, what, we're, what we're learning. Um, so when we train AI on these millions of images, it starts to learn some of these primitive concepts. Like it starts to pick up what the what the basic edges are, and then it can use that information to build up to what the basic shapes of that image are. Um, and we can actually take advantage of this. Um, so we can just recycle an older model that we trained on these millions of images, because I surely don't have enough images to train a model that, and I definitely don't have enough time to actually teach it all that. So uh, we can rely on big companies or researchers that did put in the, the original legwork to, to teach AI all this. Um, so we don't actually need to start from scratch. Um, and then, so if I showed you this picture of a cat, like you mm -hmm. can tell that's a cat even yeah. without me, me asking because we understand like the basic shapes of what a cat looks like. Uh, and then you could probably also tell that this is a dog too, right? Um, but there, there's a couple more important things that we also need to, to think about. Um, and uh, you touched on this earlier, but let's play uh, another game. Um, You're on jigsaw mode, man. You're just giving me game after game. So what is this? <laughs> All right, so I'm going to show you a bunch of... So I'm going to suggest uh, all the viewers that are watching uh, as well play along with us. Um, yeah, so... Right. So we have... Uh, I'm going to show you a, a bunch of abstract shapes. Mm -hmm. And it's it's your job to learn what they are. I'm going to each... They each have a label, okay. A or B. And you're going to need to... to I'll show you a, a unique image later, and you're going to have to, to tell yes. me what it is. Okay. Yeah. All right, so this is A. Okay. This is B. Okay, I see a lot of pink, green, and orange. Can you go back to A one more time? Yeah. Yeah, A has red, green. Okay, okay, cool. All right, and then here's another of A. So this is also type A. Yeah. So I see a lot of blue and red, and the original A had the green as well, which it doesn't have. Okay. Uh, and then here's B. Uh, okay, so it's a B, but it has green. Okay, it doesn't have the pink anymore, but. Uh, and then this is neither A or B. It does have the red, like A before. Okay. Uh, and here's neither A or B as well. Hmm. This looks uh, kind of similar to what A looked like in the beginning, but it, you were telling me it is not A or B. Okay. All right, and then here's all of them together. And here's the, the unique image that we haven't seen yet. Um, can, you, can you take a stab at what you think it is, A or B? There's no C. Okay, so well, if you if I look at the picture of B, I see a lot of pink and green, and this one has kind of pink and green, mm -hmm. but the middle was red on A, and I see that here as well. Okay. Um, if I had to take a guess, it's it kind of looks like it's neither A or B to me, but I'm gonna guess it's B because I see like two of the colors matching with B, I guess. Cool. Yeah. So. Um... The answer was actually A. Um, well, probably because of the center of that? Yeah. OK. Yeah, so and it's, it's kind of a, a bad job on my part, because I, I probably need to show you some more of these images before you understood that specifically 100% um, that the, the red circle is what we care about. Um, and that definitely is the most important part, but it's also hard to, to tell, because there are like the, the pink and the green. That like takes up the majority of the image. So for me, I would probably think that that was um, one of the, the contributing factors, like the largest factor. Um, but then also some of the other ones have, have blue in, in the background for the, the um, 
for, for the B mm-hmm. examples. Um, but, but it was A, um, and it was because of the red circle. And here, here's a real life example of, huh. of, a, of a similar scenario. And if I ask you the same question again, you would definitely probably tell me it's A, right? Yeah, I mean, we're looking at Apple now. So, right. I mean, I know what Apple is. I didn't right. know what red circle meant before. Yeah. Right. And, and so that does bring up the, the idea uh, of context of what you're talking about before. Um, so when we look at the photo, we're able to kind of throw away information that we, we have learned before, but we don't really think that about that that we've learned. Okay. Um, so we, we see this here, we see background, okay, that's probably not what they're talking about, so we can ignore that. We see a hand, normally we don't really think if somebody's holding something, we don't really care about the hand. So we can get rid of that too, and then we're just kind of left with this apple, and that's, that's all that we see. Um, but the computer, they don't see that. They just see these shapes. They don't really know that we can throw away the green, we can throw away the pink, because that's just... Because um, everything background is in noise. the picture, right. right? For a computer, it looks at the whole picture at the same time. Right. Okay. Um, and after, after we do train a successful model, we can show it a, a picture it starts to learn these these things that the, the background doesn't really matter to it. So it starts focusing on on more features in the photo that actually matter, like the, the cat's face and stuff like that. Um, so it can detect a cat. And uh, but what if we show it a photo like this? What what we would say? Because there there is a cat, but there's also a dog. Um, so so say both. Um, Maybe, maybe I mean, not. if I have trained my if, like model on just cats, probably it will know there is a cat, but it wouldn't know what to do with this part, probably. Yeah. Um, but let's say we, we trained it on both cats and dogs. But like it has but, to choose one or the other. Yeah. So I don't know how computer vision works. That's why I'm here. But uh, cat image is more, more sharper, mm-hmm. but the dog image is bigger. So based on how my model was created, I'm guessing it will choose one or the other based on that. Um, it might, because this is kind of out of focus, blurry, it might disregard that and just choose a cat. Right, yeah, those are they're both great, great points. And it, it's hard to, to know what this would say without, without testing it. Right. Um, but another thing we can do is, and uh, what we've been talking about is um, classification. And that's like looking at the entire photo and just giving it one label. But a lot of times we have lots of things in the image. So we want to be able to uh, classify uh, not just what the image is as a whole, but where things are, how many, like how many cats there are, how many dogs there are on the image. Um, and we can do that with uh, what is called object detection. Object detection um, opens up the ability to, to have a more detailed view of what is actually in the image. Um, and to train it, it's very similar to classification, but instead of just showing it a photo and saying cat, showing it a photo saying dog, um, we can show it a variety of photos, and then in each photo, um, we, we have some sort of marker to indicate that this region of the photo has a dog, this region has a cat, um, and then in the bottom image, there's four, four dogs. Um, so once we give the AI and train it on this information, if we give it another photo like this, um, uh, this this photo, it'll be able to give us something like this as an output, um, and gives us uh, the site is would be if we trained it on the basis of the animal, so the full body, but uh, we get cat in a, a box where the cat is and dog where the dog is. Um, so in practice, we, we normally break this up into three steps. We have our labeling step. Um, and this is where we go in and we, we have our, a bunch of data. Um, it doesn't really have any labels, it's just a bunch of photos. We need a way to tell the computer this is, this is what is what. Um, so with classification, we would just um, uh, organize our photos into different groups. So mm-hmm. these photos are cats, these photos are dogs. Okay. And then we could later feed that to the, the AI, which is um, what happens in the, the training phase. Um, the training phase is uh, you give it this data and you're like, okay, learn. And it just it just chugs along and it, uh, it 
goes through all the images and then starts learning. And we'll actually go more into details on what is happening in the training phase um, in future videos. Okay. Um, because that'll, that'll take I mean, so much time. I'm to, definitely to interested in learning that even more. But it kind of seems like the whole uh, labeling and training part, uh, you kind of can do it once, right? Or like not as much as you use it. So the upfront cost of doing that. But how does that uh, eventually pan out in terms of, um, because I hear a lot about like people want to do this image recognition stuff real time mm -hmm. or like on a video stream even, right? Like uh, I have seen you working on some example where like cars moving by, you want to count how many cars went by the road. Um, so once a model is trained, how fast can it get then to do it real time on even a video stream like 24 FPS? Right, so the, the, the training, labeling, and uh, actually using the model, they don't happen at the same time. So, so normally there's the, the upfront, like you label it, and that takes a lot of uh, manual labor time, and then training takes a lot of computation time. But once it's trained, you actually end up with a, a model file that you can uh, run in the browser, run on an iPhone, Android phone, uh, wherever you need to be, like a Raspberry Pi maybe. Um, and how fast it can detect is kind of dependent on how, how uh, good your, your hardware is. Okay. Um, but like with, with my MacBook Pro uh, and the, the webcam feed, it, it's pretty fast. It, it's almost uh, real time. And I have seen the video, yes. Right. So, um, and, and we'll, we'll show it again here in this um, uh, webinar once okay. um, towards the end. Okay, so if the viewers don't want to follow along, I think Nick has a, like a tutorial step, step by step, and the link to that is uh, right here. It's github.com slash cloud orientations slash training. And what I thought would be interesting, since I have never actually done this workshop, to try and fail real time, uh, live trying to do this workshop. Uh, I mean, with obviously I have Nick here helping out. Um, and if you have any questions, you can also drop it on the chat. I'm actually monitoring the chat right here. Um, and I can ask Nick the question. So in the meantime, you know, if you want to follow along, you should do it, or you can watch me fail, um, which should be fun for everyone. So, so this is the repo. If you were to like follow that link, GitHub.com/slash/cloud/annotation/slash/training, and uh, so this is also an open source project. I think Nick um, is doing most of the work. I'm recently just like looking into it if I can help out. So if you want to help out as well, you can look into this project to contribute, I guess. Um, OK, so with that, uh, we want to do classification or object detection today? Uh, let's do object detection. OK. So I'm going to go there. OK. And uh, here we have Nick kind of like having a screenshot what to do. OK. So recommendation is basic, basic understanding of using terminal, which I have. That is something okay. that is probably the only thing I have. <laughs> Are already down. Next up is creating an object storage. Uh, so why do we need the object storage, Nick? Uh, so we need the object storage because uh, when in this labeling phase, we're going to be uploading photos, and we want a place to keep them. So we're going to keep them in an object storage bucket, um, and and that lets us uh, let other people um, label our images um, if we have like a team that needs to to work on it. Um, or if I'm changing from computer to computer, it's just always there on the cloud. I don't have to worry about having like uh, thousands of images on my uh, local computer. However, uh, we're probably not going to end up using thousands of images. I think we'll probably only end up using like say a hundred, or in, I'll only make you label twenty today. Okay, so uh, that'll probably take too long. <laughs> twenty is good. Twenty is good. Okay, let's. Uh, so I'm on. Uh cloud.ibm.com, uh, then I'm going to try to create a object storage bucket. Um, so, so this that's the one where I need yep. object storage. Yep. Okay. So I'm going to create an instance of it. Anything specific I need to do for the object storage, or? Um, so you just need to uh, uh, you can name it whatever you want. Okay. Real time detection. I might I'd like to really get into like naming my stuff properly and also you know tag them I think uh, that's crucial and I'm gonna just uh, uh, viewers who create maybe a light account can create the light version I think on um, under my account I have too many of these things so I can't really create light anymore but you should be able to as a viewer okay uh, do I need to create a bucket here already or uh, no you 
you just uh, oh yeah I, I should follow the documentation that is I think smart okay create the thing I created it credentials so I'm gonna have to go ahead and create the credentials and service credentials new credentials uh, and, uh, do I have to uh, writer is good okay auto generate and I think I should include yes, HMAC yes. okay yes. yeah so I think HMAC allows us HMAC is a different way of authenticating so you should always like for this particular workshop you need to have HMAC authentication so that the CLI tool we're going to use later can access right. the bucket and everything so I'm going to okay. add that I think that concludes this particular step first now yeah uh, and then uh, you can copy those credentials down somewhere or just leave it I'll, I'll, yeah I can come back to it um, and I'll go back to okay. I did this. I did this. Okay. So if I take a quick look at my credentials, I mean, this video is gonna be saved. Someone can get it, but I'm not getting of that object storage anyway, so it's fine. Uh, so like this is my uh, all the uh, credentials. I have my HMAC keys, my API keys, and my resource instance ID. I think these are the three, four things I need, right, from right. here. Okay. So I'm going to quickly go to the next step, which is creating a machine learning instance. So t tell me a little bit more about what this does. Uh, so uh, Watson Machine Learning allows us to um, uh, upload some TensorFlow code or Keras or whatever machine learning framework you want to use. And it'll, it'll train a model for us um, using um, high-end GPUs. So okay. we can train much faster than we ever could running it locally. And also, mm -hmm. uh, a lot of times, You'll, you'll run into a lot of setup bugs and, and other things when running it locally just because um, uh, machines, uh, they are not, like going from Windows to Mac, it, it might not work as well. So so the classic, um, it run, works on my computer problem, right? Right, yeah. right. So, so this should always work if you're using... Um, yeah, and also like I think you're using uh, like TensorFlow, which uses Python. There's right. a whole versioning issue based right. on where you're running it, what environment variables you have set. It's just a whole mess. So like I'm, I'm like I'm glad we can just use like someone else's computer on the cloud. Uh, so I should also create credentials. I don't think there's anything special here. I can just uh, auto generate again. Okay. So I'm gonna add that. And from here, what are the information do I need? Um, just click new credentials, and then I think we're gonna need the username the, and password uh, anywhere, yeah, right? Password. Okay. I'm gonna just keep this page open for a second and see what are the next steps. So I did that, I have all that, okay, great, okay. So preparing training data, I think that's where many of the people probably would be interested in the tool you built. Um, so you want to talk a little bit more about the tool? Um, so Cloud Annotations tool, so. Right, so uh, Cloud Annotations tool is, it, this is what is actually going to be using our object storage bucket. Um, so we're gonna, we can log in with our, our resource instance ID and the uh, API key we got whenever we created our, um, our object storage instance. And so we're, we'll be uploading like videos or images and it'll automatically be synced to our bucket and it also gives us a nice UI to actually label the images. Mm -hmm. Um, so I should just create a bucket yeah, here. Yeah, create that. a new bucket. Okay. And, uh, uh, any specific something. name? Uh, anything's fine as long as it's, it has to be unique across uh, all of IBM. Okay, so I think I can just go my name dash real time detect. I think that should be pretty unique. Be good. Okay, unless there's a bunch of other Mofis you know, in the world walking <laughs> around. Okay, um, so Today, I think we're going to draw bounding boxes. Should I choose localization? Right, right. So yeah, we're going to do localization. Okay. That gives us the, the tools to, to draw boxes. Okay. Okay. So right now, it, it looks pretty barren over here. I have nothing. Um, so so uh, we can either drag and drop some images or, or add media. And I, I gave you um, a nice uh, data set so that we don't actually have to Yeah. So those, let's, let's, let's tell everyone where they can find the data set. So data set is actually available in what? Uh, um, IBM.box. I think it's this slash yeah, v slash, slash, slash soda workshop. workshop. So if you go to this URL, you will be able to access these two particular zip files. Um, so it's IBM.ent.box.com slash v slash soda. Oh, okay. We have uh, Upker uh, following along with us. So thanks uh, for following along. Um, yeah, so you can access the files if you're following along from this particular URL. Again, it's ibm.ent.box.com slash v slash soda dash workshop. 
Um, I should be able to drop that. Wait, our should I? Okay, I, I'm actually gonna drop that in our chat so that you don't have to. Uh, int dot box dot com slash v slash soda dash workshop. Okay. All right. Okay. So you should be able to access that file now. Okay. So I have done that. Now I can access those files. I, I pre-downloaded them just because it didn't. Uh, okay. So my data set. I can just drag all the videos. Yeah. And these are video files, not pictures. Right. So how does that work out? Um, so when you upload a, a video file to the tool, it, um, it uh, breaks it up into a bunch of frames. So you ah. end up with a bunch of images. Okay. Um, That's convenient. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so it, this is probably going to give you like hundred, a couple hundred images, um, which you don't have to, to label all now. And I actually, I strongly recommend if um, uh, to, to go ahead and try and upload your own images and videos, um, and then uh, you can have something more custom to what you need. So um, whatever you have lying around the house is fine. Just upload some some video, short videos of it, and draw boxes around it. And, have something more personal because I know if you want to test this later, you probably you might not have a, a Coca Cola bottle with you. So, and um, uh, Coca Cola is not sponsoring this video. Right. I wish they were, but they <laughs> aren't. So, if anyone from Coke is watching, please, you know, yeah. we're open to swag or free Coke, whatever. <laughs> um, probably can't take it, but anyway. Um, so, but like it's it's uh, great that you bring up that like you should use your own data set because when we were running the meetup. Uh, I actually saw someone, she had a, her beauty products and she was making a video of her while doing the meetup. And like she came to the meetup with an, like a goal to be able to use this tool to be recognizing her beauty makeup products, so, which was like super cool. And just to see like how quickly you can take this idea and like utilize for the things you want to build. So, okay, so uh, walk me through this tool. I actually had never used it. Cool, so uh, once we, we upload our photos, um, we we want to add a few labels. Uh, so I think in this in this video we have some photos of Coke and Pepsi. So go ahead and make a, a Coke label <laughs> and uh, and then a Pepsi label. Okay. Um, and then uh, go ahead and start drawing some rectangles. Um, right now you have the the Coke selected, but you can switch to Pepsi. Um, that's okay. a Coke. So uh, yeah. yeah. Okay. And also, for those of you who like keyboard shortcuts, if you hit the Q button, it'll toggle between your labels. Ah, okay. So I'm at, and also I see that Pepsi is blue and Coke is red. Is that like something? That like, was uh, just per chance. Per okay. Yeah. <laughs> well, that, that's a lucky coincidence, to be honest. Yeah. Okay. So like when I draw the box, like how fine do I have to go with this? Um, it, it doesn't have to be like crazy pixel perfect. Um, and actually. A lot of like blurry photos like this. Um, if you label these photos, um, that's perfectly okay. But then you might end up with uh, more false positives because um, this doesn't like necessarily distinctly look like a Coke bottle because it's so blurry. So mm -hmm. if it sees something blurry and red in the background, it might start to think that that is a, a Coke. Bottle. But given also that said, uh, let's say my use case is something. For example, if I want to detect moving cars. And I train my model on like cars perfectly sitting still. Mm -hmm. Isn't that like kind of disservice to my model then? Right. And um, I, I think uh, a good thing to do is have a, a mixture of both blurry and, and not blurry. But if you are going to use blurry photos, I recommend using um, a lot more photos um, just so it has a better opportunity to to learn that uh, there's other things in the world outside of the, the smudgy redness of, of this uh, blurry Motion blur and coke. Okay, so I think I mean, I, I mean it's it's taken from a video, so obviously there's a little bit more like movement in the picture. Right. So so if you go back one, um, like that, that's a great example of a coke. It's still blurry, but it's it's very easy to tell that that's okay. Coke. And uh, I I love that you have these like small lines. Uh, I don't know if you can see it in the stream, but if if I move this uh, cursor around, it actually has like a straight line going both ways, and it's super easy uh, then to go and drag like edge to edge without going over too much. So I, I did a one label of Coke and I mean in this trade it's going to take me six months to label 143 pictures. So I'm going to go a little bit faster. Uh -huh. 
And how, how do you see like labeling partial images? Sometimes the, it goes out of frame a little bit. Uh, so is that still okay to label? Yeah, yeah that's okay. Uh, I, I think uh, a good way to think about it is if you can tell that it's still Coke, um, with, with no, no context of that you saw in the last frame that it was going out of frame, um, then, then it's a good one to label. Okay, so I'm going to label that. I labeled, uh, okay, and I'll label this. Okay, label that. Um, how many of each do you want me to label? Um, let's just do 10 Coke and 10 Pepsi. Okay, cool. Um, and it's also important to point out um, if you go back to the, some of the other ones okay. with Pepsi in the image, yeah. Um, if we don't la if we do label a Coke and there is a Pepsi in the image and we don't label the Pepsi, uh, the computer will start to learn that those those Pepsi bottles um, aren't Pepsi. So if if you are labeling Coke and Pepsi in your data set and they both show up, make sure you label both of them. Okay, but like for example, the, this is a great example of the question. I, I can probably tell this is a Pepsi, but is it a good yeah, picture that, to label? That should be good. Okay, so I'm gonna actually go back and label the same images I labeled. I have eight Coke, but I'll probably add a little bit more. So I'm gonna use the shortcut Q to switch Coke to Pepsi, okay. So I don't know if I should even label this, but I'll, I'm, I'm probably okay with it. Yeah, okay, I'll label this. Uh, oh, that there's another keyboard shortcut, but the actual keywords, <laughs> this is good. Um, so I'm gonna label this one. And so right now, most of the pictures, you are in the picture. Yeah. So how does that, that play out in terms of like the model's ability to, for example, if I like all of a sudden I grab up a Coke and Pepsi bottle and start swinging around, how does that? Uh, it, I, I like to, it's, it's good to have a good variety of backgrounds because that's how the computer learns what's not actually relevant. So here it's, it's learning that my hand isn't Coke because it's, it's in these images. Um, and same thing with my face. Um, if we, it's it's a good idea to have other people's faces in the photo as well, but um, it's not necessarily 100%. Uh, like if it's if it's all my faces and we try it with you, it'll still probably work pretty well because um, our faces look very different, but they still look uh, like a pretty, face. Yeah. And uh, um, I I saw a couple of comments on LinkedIn when in, your, in one of your videos, people are asking about what if we like switch. The, like what, what if I start holding the image upside down or like in sideways or like a little bit far, a little bit smaller, a little bit more light, a little bit less light. Um, I mean, people have so much in-depth questions, which is great, but like then I should ask the same question here. Like how does, I mean, I mean, the obvious answer is you should have more data to do right. that, but um, yeah, so talk a little bit right. more about like how that, that, that plays. Right, into. so, um, for, for lighting, you if you want it to work well in a wide variety of lighting, then you need to train it in a wide variety of lighting. So make sure you have some photos of your Coke in like a very dark area and very bright. Um, uh, this example, we're only annotating from like one video. So the end result isn't going to be very good because there's not very much um, uh, variability in in these scenes because it's all from one scene. So uh, if we were to train this model with these uh, 10, 10 labels from this, this single shot, uh, the final model isn't going to be very good. Um, there's way too much code. Yeah, there's, there's a lot of code. <laughs> <laughs> so once again, I will uh, ask all our code fans. <laughs> uh, okay, but like I think I have like, 10 and 12. Yeah, uh, that's probably pretty good. Okay, I mean, again, it's it's probably pretty bad, but... We just want to get to the point where we can actually uh, train our model. Okay, um, so... For those of you at home, and you if you, if you train this little, and you're wondering why it's not working very well, uh, it's it's because we didn't use enough data, and the, the data variability wasn't very good. Right. So, uh, my recommendation, I, I think, to have like a, a pretty solid model is to have around 100 examples of each label. So um, 100 Pepsi, 100 Coke. And also probably to use similar kind of quality of picture, not even like the same light, but like the size of the picture, keep it pretty similar. Right, um, yeah, so one thing that we'll learn about later on um, is that uh, whenever we feed these images to the model, we're actually sque uh, squeezing it down to 300 pixels by 300 
analysis for this particular model. Okay. Um, so if you have a, a really wide image, um, I think I have it in the workshop. Um, I'll go to it. Okay. And then I'll scroll down towards the bottom. Yeah. So if okay. we have this really wide image, um, and we squish it down, uh, we we don't really notice that this is a, a plane anymore. It's really hard to tell because it's mm -hmm. so distorted. So it's it's good to maybe not have such wide images, but also it's good to think about if you have a bunch of um, landscape images and you're going to be taking photos on your phone um, in a portrait mode, they're going to get squashed down in a different direction than, uh, than your landscape photos did. So you're going to end up with a lot more narrow and, and uh, tall uh, images in your training set, and then in the test set, they're going to be very short and stout. So, uh, Kind of unrelated, but what's your preference between portrait and landscape? Which which side do you fall on? Uh, on my phone, I like to take uh, a portrait photos. It, it's like I don't even know you anymore. Uh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> well, you know. And, and another way to, to combat that is to have a, a variety of portrait and landscape. Because a lot of people, they, they don't want to make a model for, for a phone, a model for uh, the web, which is probably uh, landscape. Um, so, so get a good variety of portrait. So do you think it's probably like, is it worth it to say that no matter where you take the picture, you will just take a square out of the middle instead of squishing it? Um, you, you can do that too. Um, however, then you'll, you'll lose information uh, around it. So. Or how about like you just take like square, two squares, overlap them and make out two pictures from there? You could do that too. Um, and, and you could also, even if you have like a super high resolution and you don't want to lose all of like the... The information because you're shrinking it down to 300 pixels you could just slide the, the square over okay so over 300 image. pixel chunks out of the picture right make like 10 pictures out of the but one. then you have to think about that's going to take a lot longer to process because you're going to have to do like mm -hmm. 10 times the amount of work in a, right but like i think time. i think where my thinking is that like when you're doing this the training no matter how long it takes still kind of like a one-time thing you're doing right. so if it ends up being a better model for you like I think for some people, for some use cases, that might be worth it. Right, you might uh, have the better model, but um, in the, on, on inference time, you're still gonna have to cut the photo up. And you're, so each frame, you're gonna end up having to, to run it through your model mm -hmm. um, like several times, which will, like it's already, it's pretty real time, but then uh, doing that multiple times in a single frame is gonna like drastically kill your, your speed. Okay, so I think, um, I mean, again, in a future video, we're going to dive even more deeper on how the algorithm actually does deal with these images. So that this topic kind of going over my head. <laughs> I mean, I understand the point, what you're making, that if you train it a certain way, you should test and like run it a certain way as well, so that there's some consistency there. But okay, so let's just move on with the like, next step we have here. Um, so so I, I did this part. I labeled my images. Right. It's all good. So I want to go to, um, okay, training a model. Right. So I see there's like an NPM install. So uh, what is what, what am I installing? Um, so you're, you're installing a command line interface for uh, the cloud annotation tool. And that, that allows us to, um, all we have to do is run calculate train and it'll, it'll take all the data we prepared and it'll train a model. So okay. we don't have to define how uh, we need to transform this data into something that the, the model can understand. And we also don't need to define this model. Um, we're, we're by default using SSD mobile net architecture, which is uh, really good at performing really fast. Um, but there's a little bit of drop in accuracy compared to some other models out there, but this will give you a much faster uh, real time. Is it faster to run or faster to train? Faster to run. Okay, so, so this is, is this like, so the training speed is kind of the same in either way then? Um, yes, about, uh, okay. probably not like a, a huge um, noticeable difference, uh -oh. but um, you'll end up with a much faster model. Um, and a lot of like, uh, like with CoreML and um, also like TensorFlow Lite, which is what you would actually run um, on the, the iPhone or Android or whatever you're, you're running um, don't support a lot of the operations that some of the more accurate optic detections model uh, have. Um, so you wouldn't even be able to run those like 
on some of those like edge devices. So um, right. MobileNet is a good SSD MobileNet is a good um, fit for running um, it real time and on um, uh, less uh, good hardware unique devices like a phone. So I mean, so I'm a bit confused about a couple of the things, and it might be a very dumb question, but I thought we were creating the model ourselves. Now you're talking about we're using SSD mobile net model. So where, what is this model and what, what is the model I'm creating? Right. So um, we talked about earlier in the slides how we want to reuse older models that were trained by somebody else already. Um, and uh, in order to, to reuse this information, we, we need to, to use the model architecture that it was, it was trained with. Um, so if, if we wanted to build our own um, AI architecture, then we would have to, to retrain that model from scratch with the millions and millions of images. And we don't want to do that, so we want to choose some of the widely available models that are out there. Um, so some of the big names out there right now is uh, YOLO, you might have heard of. Yeah, you only look once. I actually seen a video of like, yeah. Yeah, um, and SSD is, is a similar similar to YOLO in that you only look once. Um, uh, this SSD stands for single shot detection. Huh. Um, so it, it's also, it's, a, it's very similar to YOLO. Um, and then there's another option called uh, faster RCNN. And that, that's the one that's more accurate, but it, it'll be a little bit slower. Um, and then before that, there was uh, fast RCNN, and before that, there was just RCNN. So it's a regular, so, fast, and then faster. So I think next logical question from my end would be, you mentioned the word like the RCNN four times, and I'm going to give you a guess what it means. <laughs> probably not the R, but the other three. So I'm, I know probably know what CNN is. Uh, is it convolutional neural networks? Yes. Oh, okay. what the, what does the R stand for? Then? Uh, region. Oh, I was I was gonna say recursive, but I, I was that's what I uh, normally like uh, think about too. But uh, it's because it's using um, this thing called regional proposals. So, um, which we can we'll talk about that in the on. future. Okay, because again, I heard of convolutional neural network. I've seen a couple of videos, and it just again, r right. slash wish happened a few times. So I was like. <laughs> I'm going to bug Nick to explain it to me later. Um, so, okay. So, we spent some time talking about a few of the things. And for the viewers at home, I will actually take full credit for the name Cackley. When the <laughs> naming was happening, we had a couple of options, and I kind of put my foot down and said, Cackley sounds cooler. So, yeah. So, if so if you're using Cackley and you like, love the tool Cackley, and you will when you use it, so I'll take the thanks. <laughs> um, but again, so I'm going to just quickly go and install. In this computer, I actually have never installed Cackly before. And OK. So it's an NPM install. And before I install, actually, let's, um, I think you said something about version 10, 15, 10 or above. Yeah, version 10 or above with Node. OK, I mean, that's the LTS now. So I think everybody should be on 10, 15. If you're not, you should probably think of upgrading. I think 12 came out very recently as well as LTS. So we'll look into that in the future. But you should be on version 10 or above. Uh, paste and run. So I, I actually never know like what to do. Oh, it installs so fast. I, 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 I feel, every time something installing, I'm like, ah, what do I do now? But install, so I can now, you're saying I can just do a quickly train. OK. So instance ID. Yeah. So I should, oh, that's, that's when I go find this here. Right. So my instance ID from machine, my machine learning, I should find my instance ID right here. Um, OK. Uh, my username, I should find that right there. And uh, what do I need? Oh, I didn't press Enter. My password, I could find right there. OK. And URL. OK, so these are the four things, the bottom four things we needed, right? Yeah. OK. And OK, so that, that went well. That means it was indicated proper, yep. right? OK, so object storage, we need, again, things we need, access key ID. And that's from my HMAC. HMAC yeah. I love it how you kept the name same so that I don't have to like, guess what is what. Um, secret access key is this giant thing. And USG is OK. Yeah. So I'm OK with that. I'm going to press Enter. And it found my bucket, 
that was in my thing, and I spelled my own name wrong. That is、oh. uh, sad. <laughs> okay, all right.、Uh-huh. It's okay.、Uh, can I rename my bucket? That is a question. No. Oh, good. I'm、no, sorry. It's okay. I mean, I can just call it something else.、Uh, it's fine. So, and it's telling me if I should put my output in a separate bucket. Is there any reason to do it?、Um, if you.、Uh... I normally have a separate output bucket. This is where all of our training files end up, and I just like to have a little bit of a separation where my images are here and my training results are over here. But、uh, for this, you can just do no.、Um, okay. But I see, I see by default it's yes.、Yeah. So, okay.、Uh, and also, once I do all that,、um, where does this information go? Like, for example, if I made a mistake in one of these steps, or for example, if I, if I change my mind about something. Right, so、um, if you see here, it's writing to uh, users, uh, Mofuser, and.、Uh, so it's a, the, the folder I was working on was、right. a VR demo, and it just creates a config YAML file, it looks like. Right. Okay.、Um, and then you can edit that by hand, or you can also run、uh, Cackly init, and it'll re ask you those questions, and it'll pre fill with、uh, what you've already filled. Okay. Your,、uh, okay. So you can say yes, that's okay. That looks good to me.、Uh, okay. So, what's, what's going on right now? Like, what just happened?、Uh, so, it just submitted、uh, a, a zip file of the model that we're going to train, which、um, is on the GitHub.、Uh, you don't have to look at it, but if you're interested, it's there.、Um, and so, it just submits that zip file and、um, submits it, it to the machine learning to the training. Machine okay. Training.、Um, and, and there it'll be unpacked and it'll start training based on、uh, your, your object storage credentials. It'll, it'll grab all that info. That was, was in your bucket. Okay.、Um, and then it's giving you back a model ID, and, and this lets us、uh, keep track of our model. So if you want to like, log the progress or download the model later on,、uh, we will use this model ID to tell Watson Studio which, which model we're looking for. Okay. So, I mean, is there any reason for me to monitor the progress? Should I send now?、Uh, you can say yeah, or you can see what that looks like. Okay.、Uh, so, yeah, so this will, will prepare to train, and, and this can take all. Long time sometimes it's,、uh, it's queuing up、um, you know, the GPUs and all that stuff. So, based on demand on the resources,、so、right? There's a lot of people using it, it might take a while. And,、um, but yeah. So, then after that's done, it'll say success,、uh, training submitted, and then it'll start to show you a progress bar of how long it'll actually take to train your model.、Um, and by default, it's training on a K80 GPU. And it's training for about 500 steps, which is, is not that many steps.、Um, and that'll still probably take you、uh, a good chunk of time to train.、Um, so I normally recommend,、uh, so for, for my 100 images for like two objects, I, I, train, it for, I train it for 6,000 steps.、Um, and、okay. that gave me a pretty decent model.、Um, and, and that's something uh, uh, that's a little bit of an art.、Um, and, In that case, like、uh, training data and, and the tra- actual training can, can take a lot of tweaking and、uh, testing to、um, get it, your model to a point that is、uh, good. Okay, so, so,、um, so like I'm, what I'm getting here is that like, the mobile SSD net is pretty fast to both、uh, like、in the real time detection. But then I can make my, so making my model 6,000 steps or 500 steps, does it make that? Uh, recognition slower? No. No. So it,、um, it doesn't really matter how many images you add. It doesn't matter how long you train it.、Um, it doesn't matter how many、uh, labels you have. It, it all, it's normally a pretty constant time.、Uh, not constant time in the sense that it's、uh, happening instantly, but、um, it doesn't matter how much, what you really tweak, the model is going to end up being about the same, same size. Speed, so same basically, size. Uh, if I want to get like, a better performance, I can then like, use more images, different k i n d of images,、right. and then I、uh, use a bigger, like, lump, more number of steps、right. while training it.、Yeah. And then, like, with, this, with the same like, device I was running it on, I could end up getting a better performance. Right. Okay. That's, that sounds fair. Okay.、Um, so, while that happens, I know、uh, you actually.、Um, Gave me access to one of your、um, 
models. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So I actually downla downloaded that model from uh, this. So the model underscore web dot zip. If you go to the URL again, it's ibm.ent.box.com slash v slash soda dash workshop. Um, so, okay. So I should have access to that. CD desktop. Uh, CD VR demo, and now I have access to the model underscore web. Um, so yeah. Uh, okay. So the next step is in uh, is using the model. And oh yeah, I, I should that I should go back in, uh, to this one. Here we go. Yeah. So using, so a, using model. a model, and we're going to do the the object detection for web. Okay. And then this will take you to a repo, and it'll it'll run you through the steps on how to set that up. Um, and I'm actually going to run to the other room real quick and grab some soda bottles okay. so we can actually test it later. But I trust you to figure out how to do this. Let's see if you can get it up and running before I get back. OK, I got you. OK, so I will. Um, so while Nick runs and grabs a, a Coke and Pepsi bottle um, back from the table, I will, in the meantime, uh, just clone the repo, as it said. Um, so I have Object Detection React. I'll change directory into that. And what else do I need? I need to npm install. OK. Um, OK. npm install. And that will go off and download a bunch of things. And I'm just saying I need to just copy this folder, which I which where should I copy this? I should copy this into the public folder. Okay. So basically, uh, in this React application, uh, Nick kind of gave me the model he trained on 100 plus images over uh, 6,000 steps. I think Nick locked himself up. I will. Well, close the door. Okay. So Nick is back with his uh, soda bottles. And I just it just finished npm installing, uh, so model dash web, and I copy this into public. Okay, so ls public, and I have the model dot web folder in there. Uh, what am I looking for in this model dot web folder? Um, so it, everything looks right, kind yeah. of? Okay. Yeah, you have your model, JSON, the labels, and a bunch of shards. And the shards, uh, it's, you could have just one giant uh, thing, but um, uh, they, they shard it up so that it can be cached and served a lot faster than trying to send over one giant file. Okay. So next up is running npm start. And for the best. So it's uh, loading up. Okay. And it's asking me if I want to, no, I should, <laughs> I should allow it to use my camera. And it is using the camera. And I should just like be able to do this. Ah, OK. Uh, you do this like, a lot, I see. Like, <laughs> I get confused. Ah, this Pepsi. Oh, Coke here. Pepsi, Coke. Pretty nice. Oh, wow. It's actually moving pretty fast. But also, like, the video you recorded was kind of like facing forward. Now I'm testing it kind of in an angle, but it's doing pretty decent. And it kind of knows, oh, damn. So basically, my. Uh, Camera is on this side, and I'm, trying, I'm seeing myself on the right screen. It's just like uh, so. Wow! Even with just this bit of art, knows it's a Coke. It's actually impressive. Uh, I can just try it. 
what if okay what if i tried this okay color me impressed that was uh, okay <laughs> so um that was a quick and fun little demo and okay i can kill that uh let's see where is it still running okay i can kill that and let's take a quick look at what's going on in my training so i have a i can see here that i have done about 190 steps so I think we, I would, like, we'll probably talk more about what each of these steps mean, but other than that, uh, the workshop itself, let's talk a little bit more about some other things you uh, kind of mentioned in the workshop. And if you are trying to build an application with iOS or Android, you also have uh, like a model you can give them. Right? right, yeah. So whenever you run the, the Cacli download and then your model ID that you saw earlier, uh, it'll it'll download a, a model web folder, a model iOS, and a model Android. Okay. And those are kind of bad names uh, because uh, the Android one is really just a TF Play model, um, which that could be used on Raspberry Pi or, or anywhere that you would use a TF Play. And also, same with Core Mount, you could use it on like your Apple Watch or your Mac or um, anything that, that has. So. Um, so the, I know that TensorFlow Lite works on like Android or like smaller devices. Is there any way you can make that work on iOS as well? Uh, yeah, you can actually use um, TensorFlow Lite on, on iOS too, but I prefer to use I mean, they already have Core ML, yeah. so uh, OK. And next up is some common issues. You're talking about, um, huh, there is no issue. That's amazing. <laughs> that, that's great. If you don't have an issue, that's the best issue to have. If you run into issues, please let me know, and I'll posting there. Yeah, or you know, like I can reach him much faster than you can, so like reach out to me and I'll bug him to death <laughs> until he fixes your issue. So either way, um, so yeah, so if you were, if you've been, there's some sub subliminal messages right below, we have our Twitter handles right below that, so if people saw it, they should reach out to us on Twitter. I'm on the left at MophieCodes, uh, Nick is on the right at Burdakus1. Um, and we're thinking of making this kind of like a like a series we do once a week or once every two weeks. And I have a lot of questions about AI and machine learning and image processing and image recognition stuff that you know I would like do it regardless. But I would like to bring all of you with me in this journey where I bug him and uh, yeah. So I think that kind of covers the uh, workshop for today. You want to have like any final thoughts? Talk about some more things or like kind of tease what's next to come. Uh, yeah, so I think what, what we'll be doing over the, the next few several videos, um, we'll dive deeper into the actual architecture of, of a computer vision model for classification, for object detection, and then something that we didn't talk about in this video, um, but segmentation. And that's actually drawing like a very nice tight outline around like the code model. Um, so and that, that uh, we'll, we'll go into deep details about like what the convolutional network is and how all that works together. And someone who hasn't touched their calculus in like last four years, how much math do I need to? Well, uh, we'll try to keep it as uh, math light as possible. I, I also uh, am not a huge fan of math. And, okay. Uh, so we'll, we'll go as deep as we can without having to touch too much math. Um, but then maybe we'll also have some videos for those who actually want to understand the math. Okay. Yeah, so like, uh, I mean, we initially carved out two hours for this, but I think two hours from in the middle of the day is kind of asking too much. <laughs> and we, we understood that, so we had to like cut it down in one hour, give them give you guys the hour back from next time. We're going to actually do the videos for an hour. Uh, that gives us a lot more time to get enough time to talk about everything without boring you guys too much. Um, so I think, yeah, this is this would be pretty much end uh, of this. If you have any more questions, if you want to like learn anything specific, reach out to Nick or myself so that we can put that in the curriculum in some level. Um, and yeah, this video, we're going to actually get it out and be available on YouTube. So if you want to like uh, set it, send it to other people, do. Uh, it's going to be on YouTube, and the uh, username is going to be also Mofi Codes. Um, yeah, that's pretty much it. So Nick, thank you, thank you so much, and thanks for joining. Uh, again, my name is Mofi. This is Nick. We're developer advocates at IBM. And yeah, hopefully see you next time.